Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, as I was growing up, I started out to tell you that the, the uh, most vociferous church in town was on the hill in the little town of Allison. We lived across as the, flow, uh, as the crow flies about uh, two miles from the church. Being on a hill and, and uh, nothing between us and there, we could hear them singing in their meetings and nobody sang in those days like the Pentecostals. By the way, this was a oneness, holiness, Pentecostal church. Now that's just about as Pentecostal as you can be, probably about a step and a third this side of snakes. But uh, uh, I was scared. Those people uh, talked about the Holy Spirit and it frightened me. They went through paroxysm of all sorts. We left to go. We didn't have much entertainment in Allison. We had a bank that was robbed uh, in years before that and they closed it and uh, we had a a white frame uh, painted on the side of the bank and we showed and this will this will if you know what this is you, you age yourself we showed Rin 10 10 movies and that's that's how we got acquainted with the with the film world Rin 10 10 is a dog for you youngsters <laughs> and a famous dog of my day so uh, I was afraid of the Holy Spirit I don't know whether you've ever experienced freedom, uh, the, the, the uh, kind of bondage you have to get freedom from if you're going to get right. Uh, he's not to be feared. He's to be loved. He is God. He is a member of the Godhead. To tell you the unvarnished truth, he is the only God on the planet. And before you want to argue, I want to remind you, that the essence of Jesus is at the right hand of the God who sits on the throne. When Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit, but he also specified before that that when the Holy Spirit came, he and the Father would come to dwell in us. So it is by the Holy Spirit that God lives in us, Jesus lives in us, the whole family lives in us. Somebody called it the sweet society. Where is God? Well, he's in heaven. Where is Jesus? He's at his right hand. But the, the essence of their persons are living in us. So let me just give you a little outline. I don't want to be disrespectful, but I have to erase the names. We recognize your age. We honor you. But you're out of here. Okay? <laughs> giving way to somebody who's worth it all, right? So let me talk about the Holy Spirit first and uh, just put down three things that we need to do as we think of the Holy Spirit. Number one, we need to embrace His person. And, and that's very vital. Uh, I was afraid of Him. It limited me for years into my ministry. It, it, uh, it just, it's limited. And uh, I, I fell under conviction suddenly one night when I felt like God was saying to me as I was complaining about the fact there's got to be more joy. There's got to be more power. There has to be more of a lot of things. And uh, I heard a whisper in my spirit. And this is what it said. It's the Holy Spirit. I said, well, now, wait a minute. And I did the Baptist thing on them. The Baptist thing is, look, uh, I, I don't need anything else. I got it all when I got saved. Now, that is true. But if you don't know what you got, you'll live like you don't have it. Let me say that again. If you live, if you forget who lives in you, you won't act like he does. And he lives there for a purpose. So uh, th that was the issue that bothered me and limited me for a long, long while. And I said, okay. And that was when I felt like I heard him say, uh, you are afraid of and disregarding the only God that's on this planet. 
you can't do business with Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't want to be saved without the Holy Spirit. You can't fall under conviction on your own. It takes the Holy Spirit. And He takes part in your whole regenerative process. And so, when I awakened to that, I said, Lord, I need to love Him instead of fear Him. And I began to make room for the person of the Holy Spirit. And I really believe that in, in every way I could think of at the moment, I embraced the Holy Spirit. I embraced the person of the Holy Spirit. Then I'm going to suggest that we engage His presence. I remember when we were contemplating and praying for revival, uh, and I know this is a name that's foreign to you, one of our great missionaries in the past, uh, in the middle part of the 20, 20th century, was Miss Bertha Smith. Anybody ever hear that name? Miss Bertha Smith. Miss Bertha Smith was one of the most colorful characters I had ever met. She was a missionary in China in that great Shantung revival in North China where thousands of people were saved. And all the missionaries, Baptists, Lutheran, Methodists, and all other kinds, were, were missionaries full of the Spirit of God. And they joined uh, each other in their, in their programs of evangelism and healing and spiritual life. And uh, Miss Bertha Smith, in 1969, uh, we invited her to our church. Now, in those days, and it's, it's pretty much so now, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have women in our pulpits unless we somehow explain it uh, so it won't offend a lot of people. I think we have a new day. But I let her in my pulpit, and uh, she flat preached the gospel, and uh, she preached it hard and heavy, and uh, she asked three questions. One, have you been born again? Well, now the nerve of asking Baptists, have you been born again? We created that. I mean, we started it. We major on it. But you know, under pressure, people began to get convicted. I'm not living the Christian life. Either I'm not saved or I, something needs to happen to me. And we had people get saved. We had deacons get saved. We had leaders in the women's ministry, uh, missionary union, get saved. Now I won't tell you, getting, getting saved makes a better deacon. It just makes a better deacon. And uh, so uh, things began to happen. And uh, before Miss Bertha left, my whole staff was touched and in a measure taken over. And uh, I remember her sister, uh, Betsy, wrote Bertha every day on the mission field. And Betsy was still alive. And, and Betsy broke her arm uh, in, a, in a winter storm trying to walk on the sidewalk. And Miss Bertha had to go home. And that was after Miss Bertha had, had dropped two more questions. Have you been born again? Have you been filled with the Spirit? Now that's not a Baptist question because we all assume that we have been filled. And it's true to a measure, and I'll talk with you a little bit about that. Hope we have a little time for questions. And the third question she asked was, are you being filled with the Spirit right now? Well, I won't tell you those were, the, the last two were haunting questions. I had settled long since the issue of being born again. But uh, I'm, I'm much like, I remember a conversation. Okay, here's another name, Roy Fish. He used to be interim pastor of this church in, in his aging years. But Roy died two years ago, I think. I was visiting him in the hospital a year or so ago, and he asked this question. Jack taught evangelism in Southwestern for 30 years. I was with him the week before, the week he was contacted and prayed with him about that decision. And uh, as I was visiting him in the hospital, he asked this question. Jack, why didn't we talk about the kingdom of God in the seminary more than we did? I said, Roy, I don't know. But I, th I think it's much like the Holy Spirit. We didn't talk a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. When I went to Southwestern Seminary, 
1953. Wow. Uh, I, I couldn't find a, a course on the Holy Spirit, and I was intensely interested. So I found in the catalog a, uh, an, an, an elective study of the Holy Spirit taught by Dr. Jack McGorman. And uh, uh, I, I took that course. And uh, I, I learned much about the Holy Spirit, but nothing about what I'm going to talk about in a little bit if I don't talk myself out of it. So I have to get to it before, we, uh, before long.